as we look at that word faith, many of us is familiar with the faith chapter, Hebrews chapter 11. Verse 1 defines faith as, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We, through Scripture, realize that there are three characteristics of faith. We find them in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8, Genesis chapter 22, verses 16 and 18, and Genesis chapter 12, verses 2, 3, 4. And what you will find is obedience, hope, and believe, or belief. For example, in Romans 4, verses 12 through 16, we read, And the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only. But who also walked in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. So Abraham is the father of faith who was not circumcised. So we who believe that are not Jews, our spiritual Jews through Father Abraham's faith that we exercise. <clears throat> and I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within you, and I will take the stony heart out of their flesh, and will give them a heart of flesh. Ezekiel eleven nineteen. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give you a heart of flesh. Ezekiel thirty-six twenty-nine. So God is going to take that stony heart of disbelief, unbelief, and give you a heart of flesh. Isn't that the promise in Jeremiah? The New Testament covenant that he would write his laws upon our hearts. The Ten Commandments are written in stone, Romans 2, 29. But he is a Jew, which is one outwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not after men, but after God. So here Paul is talking about the spirit of the law and the letter of the law. So let's take a look at a couple of examples of what Paul is talking about. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 21, we read, Ye have heard that it was said of them of old time, that thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. That is the letter of the law. But Jesus says, But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause um, shall be in danger of the judgment. That's the spirit of the law. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. The letter of the law. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5 verse 28, But I say unto you, That whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, Has committed adultery with her already in his heart. And that is the spirit of the law. So we see here the difference between the spirit of the law and the letter of the law. By the way, in the spirit of prophecy, we were told <clears throat> that um, if a woman dresses provocatively and a man lusts lust after her, she is just as guilty as the man. So women, be very careful how you dress and not dress according to the fashion of the world. Also, that verse, Matthew 5, 28, also refers to a woman nowadays, especially nowadays, who lusts after a man. So righteousness is the standard that God holds us to. So <clears throat> let's take a look at an example of unrighteousness found in uh, Mount of Blessings, chapter 3, The Spirituality of the Law, page 45 through 77. The prophet Hosea pointed out what constitute the very essence of Phariseeism. In the words, <clears throat> Israel is an empty vine, he bringeth forth fruit unto himself. Phariseeism is self-centeredness, is selfishness. Hosea 10.1 In their professed service to God, the Jews were really working for self. 
Their righteousness was the fruit of their own efforts to keep the law according to their own idea and for their own selfish benefit. Hence, it could be no better that they were. In their endeavor to make themselves holy, they were trying to bring a clean thing out of an unclean. The law of God is as holy as he is holy, as perfect as he is perfect. It presents to men the righteousness of God. The law of God, the moral law, the the natural law, presents to men the righteousness of God. It is impossible for man of himself to keep this law. For the nature of man is depraved and wholly unlike the character of God. The works of the selfish heart are as an unclean thing and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. Isaiah uh, 64 verse 6. Mount of Blessings, page 54.1. You see why God had to take that stony heart and make it a heart of flesh? While the law is holy, the Jews could not attain righteousness by their own efforts to keep the law. The disciples of Christ must obtain a different righteousness of character than from those of the Pharisees if they would enter the kingdom of heaven. God offered them in his son the perfect righteousness of the law. If they would open their hearts fully to receive Christ, then the very life of Christ, his love, would dwell in them, transforming them into his own likeness. And thus, through God's free gift, they would possess the righteousness which the law requires. But the Pharisees rejected Christ being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, Romans 10.3. They would not submit themselves unto the righteousness of God. Are you submitting yourself to the righteousness of God? Are you accepting His law, His Son, His love? Or are you letting your children play sports on the Sabbath or going shopping on the Sabbath or going out to restaurants to eat lunch on the Sabbath? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. But not only that, Matthew 4, 4 says that we are to live by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. We can't pick to do this and not do that. We have to surrender to allow the love of God through the Holy Spirit to change our characters. Let's take a look at works. 2 Timothy 3.17 That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Titus who, uh, 2.14 Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity, talking about Jesus, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. For we are his workmanship, created in Jesus Christ unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. That's Ephesians 2.10. You see, good works are required. But if you're abiding in Christ, you will do good works naturally versus trying to do good works to be saved. The Lord commanded us to do all these statutes to fear the Lord our God, for our good always, that we might preserve us alive as it is at this day. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God, as he has commanded us. Now, that's Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 24 to 25. Now, remember those three characteristics of faith I talked about earlier. Obey, hope, believe. I'm going to reread that. And I'm going to interject those words. The Lord commanded us to do all these statutes. Obey. To fear God. That's the first angel's message. Character. To fear the Lord our God. 
for our good always, that he might preserve us alive. There's the hope, as it is unto this day. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do, to believe, all these commandments before the Lord our God, as he has commanded us. So there's your definition of faith, biblically. So, <clears throat> the Sermon on the Mount. It's a very blessed sermon, very blessed book. The righteousness with Christ taught is conformity of heart and life to the revealed will of God. So if he does not speak to you directly, if his providence does not lead the way, then his written word is the revealed word of God. Therefore, therefore, it's very important, very, very important that you understand the difference in the Bible versions out there. Are we that gullible to think that Satan would just sit back and allow all these different versions to be placed out here? And none of them have to do with error or deceit? Sinful men came before righteous only can become righteous only as they have faith in God and maintain a vital connection with Him. Righteousness is holiness, likeness to God, and God is love, 1 John 4, 16. It is conformity to the law of God, moral law, health law, for all thy commandments are righteous, Psalms 119, verse 172. And love is the fulfilling of the law, Romans 13.10 Righteousness is love and love is the light and the life of God. The righteousness of God is embodied in Christ. We receive righteousness by receiving Christ. That's also found in Mount of Blessings, page 18.1 Are you rejecting Christ as the Pharisees going about your own selfish works? Or are you accepting Christ as your Lord and Savior by surrendering to Him? So health reform. Through health reform, truth and righteousness will meet. Uh, 6T, page 37. So truth and righteousness meet together through the health reform. God's way of building faith leading to Christ's perfection. <clears throat> I'm going to read this through, and then I'm going to interject uh, certain words again. The time of trouble is the crucible that is to bring out Christ-like character. Okay, let's read that. The time of trouble, or Sunday law, Jacob's time of trouble, is the event, which is the crucible, which is the process God uses, that is to bring out Christ-like character, God's goal. The crucible is the event and the process that God uses to reach his goal in us and for us, which is Christ-like character. It is designed to lead the people of God to renounce Satan and his temptations. The last conflict will reveal Satan to them in his true character, that of a cruel tyrant. And it will do for them what nothing else could do, which is to uproot Satan entirely from the affections. For to love and cherish sin is to love and cherish his author. And the deadly foe of Christ, when they excuse sin and cling to their perversity of character, they give Satan a place in their affections and pay him homage. Remember, Christ works through the frontal lobe. Satan works through the hypothalamus. That's why it's all about emotions, affections. affections. That was taken from Signs of the Time, the chapter Love and Unity, August 12, 1884. Now, to build character, God has the test. God has to put us in difficult circumstances. But please understand, it's only a test. These next words are designed to comfort you and me, to help us to understand 
what God is doing to us and for us and why he's doing it to us and for us. Listen to this. Strength for every trial. Our high calling, page 323. Our Heavenly Father measures and weighs every trial before he permits it to come upon the believer. He considers the circumstances and the strength of the one who is to stand under the proving and test of God. And he never permits the temptation to be greater than the capacity of resistance. So whatever comes upon you, whatever the difficulty, whatever the trial, whatever the circumstance, God already knows you have the capacity to resist. You might not know it, but God knows it. If the soul is overborne, the person overpowered, this can never be charged to God as failing to give strength and grace, but the one tempted was not vigilant, prayerful, and did not appropriate by faith the provisions God had abundantly in store for them. Christ never failed a believer in his hour of combat. The believer must claim the promise and meet the foe in the name of the Lord, and he will not know anything like failure. That's also Manuscript 6, 1889. So God already knows. He knows you have the ability. You just have to believe that God has put you in this position to develop your character. Uh, this is my favorite. This is from Mount of Blessings, page 71.2. When you understand this, read it two or three times. Listen to this two or three times. It will give you peace. The, pro the Father's presence encircled Christ. And nothing befell Jesus but that which infinite love permitted for the blessing of the world. So when Jesus was getting beat, 40 lashes minus one. When his beard was being ripped out, spit in the face. The Father permitted it for the blessing of the world. If Christ had not have stood fast and had not have sinned, had not have went up on Calvary's cross, cruel cross, he would have never blessed this world. Here was Jesus' source of comfort, and it is for us. Whatever happens to us is to develop character so we can be a blessing to the world. He who is imbued with the Spirit of Christ abides in Christ. Now listen, you have to be abiding in Christ for this to apply to you. The blow that is aimed at you falls upon the Savior who surrounds you with His presence. Whatever comes to you comes from Christ. Don't blame it on the devil. Please understand, like Job, Satan came to Christ and said, oh, you got a hedge around Job. God said, well, go touch him. Take his children, take his flocks, take whatever you want to do, but just don't touch him. In other words, don't take his life. Satan failed, came back to God. Did Job serve you for not? Okay, well, you go touch him. You notice God said, you touch him, but you can't take his life. So God measures and weighs the temptation before he allows it to come upon us. Jo God knew Job had the capacity to resist. And Job did, praise God. So, back to Bound of Blessings, page 71. Whatever comes to you comes from Christ. You have no need to resist evil, for Christ is your defense. Nothing can touch you except by our Lord's permission. And all things that are permitted work together for good to them that love God. So if you're in Christ, please understand. God is only chastising you because you're out of Christ. You're violating His law, moral or health laws. Or you're being pruned to develop more fruit. That's it, folks. God is not interested in having you in misery or pain or suffering. He's only, he's only desirous of developing your character.
to the similitude of the character of his side so you can become a blessing to the world. Let's read another one now. Remember we're talking about the standard of righteousness. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Philippians chapter 2 verse 13. In the world ye shall have tribulation, says Christ, but in me ye shall have peace. Satan cannot manufacture God's peace. So that's one of the ways you can pretty much be sure that you're, in, you're inviting in Christ if you have peace of heart, mind, and soul. The trials to which Christians are subjected in sorrow, adversity, and reproach are the means appointed of God to separate the chaff from the wheat. That's what it's for, folks. I'm doing a series called The Shaking, The Sifting. These trials, if you pass them, if you endure them, are designed to separate the chaff from the wheat or the sifting process. Our pride, selfishness, evil passions, and love of worldly pleasure must all be overcome. Therefore, God sends us affliction to test and prove us and show us that these evils exist in our characters. Praise God. For these tests, these trials, these afflictions. That's the sanctification process, folks. He can't show you everything at once. You would faint. You would grow discouraged. You would give up. Praise Him. We don't wrestle with flesh and blood. The enemy's not your children. The enemy's not your spouse. The enemy's not your employer. God is allowing these things to happen to show you what's in your heart. Are you listening? Are you paying attention? Are you being self-centered? Self-pity? Boo-hoo? Poor me? We must overcome through God's strength and grace that we may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. For our light affliction, says Paul, which is but for a moment, worketh which are seen, oh, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Afflictions, crosses, temptations, adversity, and our varied trials are God's workmen to refine us, sanctify us, and fit us for the heavenly garner. Praise God, folks. I pray now you'll have the right conception, the right view of why these things are happening to you. You're either being chastised because you're not abiding in Christ, because you're violating either the moral law or the health laws, or you're not living by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Or, the other reason, all those go together with the um, chastisement, or you're being pruned to bring forth much fruit. And John, he says, he, listen, he says it three times, fruit. The third time he says, much fruit, Christ-like character. That quote was from Volume 3 of the Testimonies, page 115.1. So, being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. So all that is happening to you, if you're in Christ, is God willing to do of His good pleasure in you so He can finish the good work He has started in you? So listen to this one. Remember, we're talking about righteousness. We're talking about obedience. We're talking about developing Christ-like character. This is the road. 
Jesus said, if they do this to a green tree, what do you think they're going to do to a tree that's dried? Jesus says, do you know the way? Christ went through adversity. He went through pain. He went through suffering. That is the Christian way. God leads His people on step by step. He brings them up to different points calculated to manifest what is in the heart. Once again, the sanctification process. You went through justification. We talked about that at the beginning of this talk. Now He's taking us through the sanctification process. Some endure at one point, but fall off at the next. At every advanced point, the heart is tested and tried a little closer. I told you, it's always, it's always about a test. If the professed people of God find their hearts opposed to this straight work, it should convince them that they have a work to do to overcome. <clears throat> if they would not be spewed out of the mouth of the Lord. Is that not the church of Laodicea? Being spewed out of the mouth of the Lord? Said the angel, God will bring his work closer and closer to test and prove every one of his people. Some are willing to receive one point, but when God um, brings them to another testing point, they shrink from it and stand back because they find that it strikes directly at some cherished idol. That's what's happening in your life, folks. When you turn from God, you've decided to keep your idol. Therefore, you're in violation of the very first commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Think about that. Here they have opportunity to see what is in their hearts to, that shuts out Jesus. They prize something higher than the truth, and their hearts are not prepared to receive Jesus. Individuals are tested and proved a length of time to see if they will sacrifice their idols and heed the counsel of the true witness. If any will not be purified through obeying the truth, and overcome their selfishness, their pride, and evil passions, the angel of God has the charge. They are joined to their idols. Let them alone. Ooh, that sounds like Ephraim. That's when the Holy Spirit leaves you. That's when nothing more can be done for you for salvation. Now, only God knows when that time comes. But it, the quote did say, for a length of time. And nobody knows how long that length is. And the angels pass on their work, leaving those with their sinful traits and unsubdued to the control of evil angels. Those who come up to every point and stand every test and overcome, be the price what it may. Spouse, children, Land, money, position, whatever it may be, have heeded the counsel of the true witness, and they will receive the latter rain and thus be fitted for translation. That's what it's going to take, Laodicea. As you sit back, believing you're rich and need of nothing, God has a process for you to go through. Will you submit to it and go through it? Or will you be like the Pharisees and shut out Jesus? We all have a choice. I pray that this lesson, of this talk has benefited you. I praise God and I pray that we can do part three in the near future. God bless. Amen.